Welcome to DaVinci's Discourse, where the minds of today's most innovative entrepreneurs are unveiled and explored. And my name is Kyle Campbell, your guide on this journey into the depths of the entrepreneurial psyche. So sit back, relax, and get ready to dive into the minds of the greats. This is DaVinci's Discourse. All right, let's rock it. So Dave, it's a pleasure to have you, my friend. Why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? You know, what do you do? Well, I... um. I graduated as a uh, statistician from uh, a PhD program and, and been, was teaching at Cal for several decades. And uh, I drifted into uh, advertising, into strategy, and to market research, and ultimately into branding. And so for the last really 30 years, I've been engaged in trying to advance the uh, the role of branding in business strategy and, and business operations. Fascinating. Okay. Interesting, man. So when it comes to branding, what are some of the things that you've noticed that people make mistakes on when they, when they go to brand their, whether it be themselves personally on social media or whether it be their companies that they're looking to grow? What are some of the typical mistakes that you see individuals make and it just makes you grind your teeth every time you see them? Well, I, I think the first mistake entrepreneurs make is that they don't sort of uh, um, elevate branding to a really st a strategic role that it should have. And um, hmm. there's usually there's a lot in their plate. You know, there's uh, uh, they have to raise money. They have to get the uh, the product or the service off the ground, get a beta test, get that proved. And they, they surround them with people that can do those things. But they don't tend to surround themselves with um, uh, with the marketing people that really understand branding. And they often don't have the financial resources to access those people on the outside. And But even if they do, they, they that's sort of, um, a third level priority and uh and if but the but the reality is that uh if you if you uh have a a disruptive innovation you need to explain it and 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 that's a branding problem you know what are the the uh, several things that this should have you know you take salesforce that now uh, 25 years ago started in a, an apartment and um, they started with a brand concept. You know, they were gonna they were gonna bring cloud computing to software, and they were gonna explain to them what cloud computing was. And it was really important to them to to make them understand that if you're evaluating software, you need to consider the uh, the upfront cost. You you need to consider <clears throat> the pain of of updating. And the cost of, of delaying an update for 10 months until it's, you know, it's ready to go. And then the cost of shutting down to do that. And and they have to, uh, you know, explain uh, the, the the security that you get from from that. And at the same time, they generate a personality, a, you know, a feisty underdog that's taking on the, the existing world. And... Uh, and all that is is a, a branding problem, and and they were were very good at it. They had really an instinct for branding, and also they had a fifth pillar, and that was, uh, you know, this is one percent. You know, devote one percent of our profits and sales to uh, worthy causes, and so that was that was their brand, and uh, and it was really instrumental in their pulling off one of the most successful entrepreneurial stories of our time. Interesting. Well, definitely, right? When it comes to branding, do you think that there's a ma major differentiation between direct response marketing and branding? How do you see that those two go together? Because when you talk about branding and getting that message and that story across, what comes to my mind is the marketing that goes into it as opposed to the brand name, the way that somebody thinks about a company. The, the way that I think about it is you'd have to market the message to be able to have them understand the brand ethos. So how do you look at the, the difference between direct response marketing and branding? Well, it's uh, there's a uh, ongoing pressure that exists at the beginning of a venture, and and but it persists it persists all the way along. There's a uh, 
there's sort of demand marketing that creates short-term sales. Right. And that's sort of necessary for survival. It's necessary for growth. And uh, it gets uh, a lot of tension because it's measurable. You know, right. you can, you get an ROI. And, uh, and so branding is, is uh, uh, even for those that, that uh, believe in it and give it lip service, it's really hard to justify taking resources away from demand marketing. And, uh, and it's also, it, it is not so much difficult to decide, but difficult to, to do to control demand marketing. So it's not a, uh, it's not off brand. It is not instead of building the brand, it, it's it's destroying or diffusing the brand, and uh, or damaging the brand, and so um, that's a perennial problem. And um, one of the ways that uh, personifies is that sometimes these these budgets and organizations are separate, and they become silos. You know, you have the marketing mm -hmm. silo and you have the sales silo, and uh, and that's. Um, you know, some good CEOs and good organizationals find ways to make them work together, and uh, and others, uh, you know, they they lose some long term success potential because they focus on on sales and demand marketing. Right. So then it comes down to how do you know what to brand yourself as that's going to be well received in the marketplace? Let's say that I'm starting a new company and I'm looking to build this story that will be um, remembered and and really cement my my position in the mind of this person that's in my marketplace. How do I go about knowing what will 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 work and what won't? How do I think about the testing process to really start to get my branding down pat? So that it will resonate, it will be remembered. Um, let, let's say I'm starting a company. Where do I start with that? Well, I think uh, a cornerstone is uh, my belief that uh, uh, that a brand is going to stand for more than one thing. You know, three, four, five things. Like I said, Salesforce stood for um, five things that I li I, I listed. And um, so I think it's it's uh, it's very useful to try to figure out what do you want to stand for. When somebody says, "What do you do?" or "Why do you do it?" you 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 can point you can use these five things as a structure to communicate, and, and it also provides a structure to emphasize what you're delivering as well, because it can provide guidance as to what what you are delivering, what you need to do well. And what you avoid uh, need to avoid real bad mistakes, and uh, so you can deliver. And uh, so I, I think that's that's uh, one sort of approach to do that. And then once you get these pillars, like the uh, you know the the idea that uh, if you have software in the cloud, you don't have to have this annual upgrade thing and, and all that goes around that. And then you can build that out and find ways to communicate it. And also, of course, find ways to make sure you're delivering on it. And uh, uh, and along the way, in, in doing that, it's helpful to have branded features or branded services or um you know, branded people that support each of these things. So they're not, there's not a, a a label that's standing off by itself, but that uh, it's supported by a whole portfolio of brands. Hmm. So I, I, I like to say that, yeah, if, what do you if, mean you, by that? if you have some secret sauce, something that really differentiates you, that, that really um, makes it uh, uh, attractive, brand it. It, it just really helps you. It helps you communicate because it's hard to communicate anything without a brand and it helps you uh, own it as well. Um, you know, I go back to the um, hotels chain that generated the heavenly bed. And that was uh, uh, the first really, really upscale bed that, that, you know, addresses a key role of a, of a, um, uh, hotel to help you sleep and uh, uh, 
anyway, and you know, you look at the unique clothes, the, the uh, clothing retailer from Chan, they have, they have heat tech for fabrics that keep you um, warm in the winter. And then they have airism fabrics that keep you cool in the summer. And, and, uh, and these are just terrific fabrics and, and uh, every well, most clothing companies, especially outdoor ones, are trying to compete with that, but they don't have those brands. They don't have airism. They don't have heat tech. Right. Okay. So you're saying to identify your values and really the, the core structure that makes your company differentiated as opposed to others in the, in the marketplace and to really lean into those strengths, those differentiators, uh, as opposed to knowing that you've got the secret sauce, but not fully leaning into it. Um, the question becomes, how do you know what exactly to lean into if you are running a company who doesn't necessarily have a major differentiator in the marketplace? Um, you're saying to start with finding that and then lean way into it when it comes to branding it? Yeah, I think uh, of your three to five the different things, there should be something that that uh, that really stands out. If you look at... Uh, uh, the Hawes School of Business, for example, they have a set of brand pillars. And uh, one of them is confidence without attitude. And it turns out that it's a huge differentiator. It attracts students, it attracts recruiters, it attracts professors, and uh, it affects uh, the way they uh, they operate. It affects who they are, that affects, you know, who's running the, that shop. And, uh, and, 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 um, the lesson from that is that that this this brand pillar can affect the organization. This brand pillar can be a basis for differentiation. I mean, Harvard and and Stanford and Chicago would kill to be able to to have people think they have students that have confidence without attitude, mm -hmm. but they don't. Their students have an attitude, <laughs> and uh, it's just the way it is. And um, and at Berkeley it's different, and um, and they branded that, and uh, and th another thing is that when you develop these pillars, the label is really important. Right. Uh, it, it's it? not just to say that you know we're innovative, uh, we're high quality. That's not good enough. You have to say we're um, you know innovative in a certain way. You know we're uh, we're we were practical. We're practical innovators, or um, you know, we're you know creative innovators, or you you have to have uh, something that that helps give your story, and not just that that uh, you know. There was a time in, in every single business school in the in the world was global, entrepreneurial, and um, and social. You know, in, interest in social causes, every single one, and uh, so you have to find a way to differentiate your take on those, on those things. Or you have to find other ways, like confidence without attitude. If every single company is a certain way, and all of them have this, these same, these same, um, I guess, the same way of, of operating in the marketplace. How do you go about finding these words that you can really stick yourself to when it comes to a service that um, is like, it doesn't matter what it is. If if you've got well, something and you're not sure exactly what to lean into, how do you go about well, finding, is finding it, you know, what it, to lean into for your brand? Well, it, they used to say in advertising, if you have nothing to say, sing it. <laughs> and at least at least you'll be memorable and catchy and have an attractive personality. Um <laughs> But uh, uh, I think that one of the things is that that uh, the only way to succeed uh, and, and grow if you have an existing business is to uh, is to have some kind of a disruptive innovation, which I wrote a book on that called Owning Game Changing Subcategories. But it's all about creating must uh, yeah must haves that have. Uh, some new or better, uh, you know, product benefits or service benefits, or di newer, different ways to connect with the 
uh, with the uh, with with their customers, and it could be uh, a, a social program they admire, or it could be a, uh, a a sense of ethics and so on that's visible and they believe in. Um, so it it doesn't necessarily have to be a product mm. feature, but but unless you have a disruptive innovation, unless you have a must have that others don't have, and unless you can brand it and own it, your chances of success are are very low. The, there, of all the research done in marketing in the last century, by far, the Roma the most robust research finding is that if you want new product success, you know what the one characteristic is the most important? Tell me. No, be different. It has to be different. Right. Uh, it, it, and, uh, Think different. And if you look at all these, really seriously, you look at all these studies on new product success and what, what predicts new product success, it's always, always, always different. Well, if you, you could have a product the same that's, thing, that's very it, it, different in the marketplace, but it's not necessarily going to be better. I mean, you could have a bed that's different because it's made of rocks, but it's not necessarily going to work because it's different. Yes, but it's not going to to appeal to the people. So the question becomes, how do you go about finding this difference that's going to be well um, taken well, I, by I, the marketplace? I define what I meant by difference, and that was it has to have a must have, and that has right. to be a new or better you know, feature of the of the offering or new or better way to connect with the brand. Just the position. That, it, yeah. I don't mean that just to be different, to be different, to make a bed out of rocks. Right, right, right. So you're saying either the something within the product or the service, there is a differentiator in there that you can lean into or the way that you position and market it. There's a way that you can uh, change a certain word or or own a category no, it's, or it's, subcategory. It's a, it's a within the marketing um, positioning of it. It's not something that's different. It's something that represents a must-have. That there's a worthwhile segment that must have. That that things that don't have that or are weak in that development will be less relevant to them. That means that it's less likely that they'll even consider buying it. Right. So how do you find and out so, what the must-haves? That's the the golden question at the end of the day. Because if you need something that's a must-have, it's obvious you got to lean into that for your branding. How do you go about finding out the what's needed, the must-have in any marketplace? What are your steps? Well, you, you, I think you're you. If you're an entrepreneur without one, then you're wasting your time. You you either have one or you're not in business. And if you're an established company, if you don't have one, you're not going to grow. And so you you should try to find one. And I'll 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 tell you if you're in a mundane taken for granted product with a taken for granted brand. One way to do that is to develop a social program, a social program that can energize, a social program that lifts your image, a social program that can engage people. And those are all, that's the three mm -hmm. elements of brand. That's what brand equity is. And you can do that through a social program if your product is not that exciting. Like take Dove, for example. Dove in, in 2004 had sort of... Um, used up its moisturizer positioning because of their uh, product expansions and because they, their patent ran out. Mm. So they, they sort of didn't have anything. So how can they uh, energize Dove, which was a $2.6 billion company then? And they developed a real beauty program to help women and girls understand that this artificial real beauty uh, concept was, was just was was garbage and needed to be replaced and they developed for teenage girls a self-esteem program that was a sister program and they uh they developed a dozen sort of stories during the ensuing two decades almost and uh you know one of them for example was a uh, a program where they had a, a person that draws a a, a person's face based on their description or not face their whole body and uh and um they did it from a self-expression of that woman and they did it from another woman who was uh, observing her and describing her 
And the tagline was, you are more beautiful than you, than you think because of your self-description was 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 very unpleasant uh, a picture, whereas that of somebody else was was much kinder. That that they ran an ad to describe that study. This was in 2013. They'd done that something like that almost every year. That was the most viral ad that was ever run up until that date. The most viral ad ever. Hmm. 180 million views. And just think of what that did to the Dove brand, how much energy it gave, how much visibility, how much image lift, how much connection, and, and how much engagement. I mean, all those girls that went to self-esteem classes, all those <clears throat> women that 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 shared those ads and so on. And Dove Soap went from 2.6 billion to today it's like six and a half billion. Mm -hmm. And it's all driven by the 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 uh th that uh, real beauty train. So and you know, I can give you dozens of examples. I I wrote a book on that called The Future of Purpose Driven Dra Branding that explains how if you want energy, you want an image lift, and you want engagement. The three core elements of brand equity for your brand, and you and you're not getting it, which is ninety percent of the brands. Develop a social program mm. that will d d give that to you and connect it with the brand. And it doesn't have to be a, a social program you develop. If you take Thrivent, a, a financial services company, one of the Fortune five hundred, and uh, they they sponsored Habitat for Humanity something like 17 years ago and uh and and they have two million customers to uh and uh, a, a bunch of employees and these people you know organized in zip clubs or the little brand communities and they went on and did social good and and most of their effort are around habitat for humanity they went to africa for a week with a team of them They've developed. They've they've uh, six point two million hours of volunteering has has gone into that. They've raised three hundred million dollars, and it, they've involved a host of something like eight hundred and and uh, sixty thousand people among their members and employees have been involved in there, and the rest of them have have, have, have friends that have done it. So, it it's done so much mm. for Thrivent. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the podcast and I want to let you know that I've got a free book that you can get if you want to tap into more of these resources and you can get that for free at kylesbook.com. Back to the podcast. And you know, if you're a financial services company, first of all, the, the main thing you want is, is trust and, and so on. And, uh, and, and the other thing, it is really hard to talk about financial services and get people to listen to you. They don't give a shit. Right. Uh, it's just a nuisance at, at best, and and just think what Habitat has done for Thrivent. Hmm. So you're saying to go into something, and it's so interesting because when you lean into one of these social programs, it's a self perpetuating machine that you're building because the traffic is built into the the concept itself because the people will share it on social media or they'll. They'll tell their friends about it, which gets more people involved, which then perpetuates this feedback loop. Um, let's say that I'm starting a company and I'm interested in getting more traffic and, and propelling my brand, getting it out there. How do I start to think about generating one of these social programs for my company? Well, first of all, it, it's it, it's typically social programs involves grants, a volunteer program, um, uh, an energy goal. A uh, ESG report, an energy and goal. The, what, what do you mean by an energy goal? Oh, when, by in five years we're going to do sorry energy energy usage by thirty percent. Okay, I see. and um, we're going to use uh, uh, you know uh, CO two friendly packaging or something. But anyway, um, the, all those things they don't do what I've just said. They don't give you. Uh, a visibility and image or engagement lift. What is needed is a real signature program that's branded, like the Real Beauty program, and uh, and it has to be out there with credibility, doing real social good. It has to touch people. Mm. It has it, people mm. have to say, "God, you got to know about this," or 
th that's right. really needed. I, I really feel for those people that are sitting there in Africa without a home and we can build a home for su such a, a low amount of money and make a whole difference in their lives. And I hear stories about some people that ha have lived there. It's changed their lives. I've heard stories about the volunteers and how it's changed their lives. And right. and so you need something that really impacts. It's branded. That's that you can see and feel. It and it's the heart. it can't it doesn't get there with a grant program, a volunteer program, and energy goals. And say something of an ESG report. And don't get me talking about that. So you're saying you get to have something that really touches people at the end of the day, something that touches their heart and it motivates them to act in some way. So can you walk me through step by step if I wanted to start a social program for my company? Let's say that I'm well, look at Salesforce. Salesforce when sure. um when uh the uh when when the, the CEO got back from India, he had a retreat in India, and some guru that said that you can combine social good with business. And he was really inspired by that. And so in this in this apartment, when he was generating uh the idea for a, a service in the cloud, he he said, We're gonna have a company that from the get-go is going to do our share. And he developed a 1% program, 1% of the, the, the stock. It's not it's modified somewhat now, but 1% of the sales and 1% one of the product and 1% of the, of the employee's time is going to be devoted to do social good. And, uh, and then it, it, I don't know, six, seven years later, he, he said, you know, he put out the challenge to other companies why don't you also be a 1% company and, uh, and take this branded right. program and run with it. And, uh, and, and now 10,000 other companies have done that. Mm. And, and you think about the people that work at those 10,000 companies. I mean, they know where the 1% came from. And what do you think they think about Salesforce? A lot of these companies are in a, in a high tech business. A lot of these companies are customers of Salesforce. And just think what they think of Salesforce because of that. I mean, they are now part of the 1% family hmm. that Salesforce started. And that's, that's the Salesforce heritage. And they did that in the, in the, they did that in the, when they were conceiving the company, that was part of the conception. So again, when it comes down to formulating my own social program for my company and branding and, and being able to get this into the marketplace, where do I start? How do I know where to start? That's going to have a message that resonates with the marketplace. Where do I begin with it? Well, in in the case of, uh, of I I don't I don't know how it started at Thrivent, but my guess is that some people were volunteering for Habitat. And then they, they got others and others, and pretty soon there was several dozen, and pretty soon there was several hundred, and pretty soon um, they they went, I don't know if they went to the uh, top management or the top management saw that and said, you know, this this seems to be working on a small scale. Why don't we scale it up? And uh, so th that's one where it, it often works. You know, Barclays was once the least trusted company in the least trusted industry in the UK and they didn't couldn't do anything to change the needle on trust and then they decided to change their purpose and they made a purpose that was socially oriented be your best in the right way or something and um, uh, and they they had employees to create programs and the employees created 40 programs and they zeroed in on, on two or three and one of them was the digital eagles which were to help uh, people older people and younger people adapt to the uh, digital age so they could thrive and not just get frustrated and they made stories out of that one was a uh, steve rich who's a uh, a footballer a soccer player that that could no longer play because of injuries and he uh, started playing walking soccer. He could do that. And he wanted to develop a website. So he went to the digital legals who helped him develop a website. And they told a story about that. Mm. And that you got to know Steve Rich, his, his wife, his, his grandson, his mate. And uh, it was really a touching story and how he really got energy in his life through uh, walking football on the role of the digital eagles uh, play to, to allow him to become a, a, me, a mover of that whole activity. And uh, and so they started out, put out these stories, the Steve Rich story, but other stories and, and other programs. And and their uh, 
trust went up 42%. Wow. It went up the three right and a half times. The right way. Three times, three and a half times what it did under these, these product ads they were running yeah. before that. Mm. So instead of focusing on the product and the features and the benefits, like everybody focuses and preaches, why don't we talk about focusing on the the impact that you're having in the marketplace or the, the you can pivot the messaging instead of it being about the product being either about the people or about the impact that the the product has instead of it's essentially like a meta benefit it's the benefit of the benefits right there's a, a certain um well you can look at it as a hierarchy of of benefits that you can you can and so you're talking about going up to a higher benefit uh, at a way that it scales and is is able to be um, grasped by more people at a, at a deeper level. I'm still struggling with finding out how to figure out what to to use. Well, as anyway, that, that first branding. of all, you should realize that it, you're not changing from from uh, pillars around your offering to to the social pillar, but you're adding a social pillar, and that's helping you in the in the aggregate be more differentiated and more attractive. Right. But you're not going to just focus. You're saying to focus on the product as well as the story. Yes, of course, of course. Okay, okay. Because, yeah. but if you're came... Dove Soap, I mean, right, right. How how much can you? How much energy do you get out of talking about Dove Soap? But it doesn't mean you shouldn't, you know, ignore that. You talk about energy. How much energy do you get out of talking about Dove Soap? Do you mean literally how much energy that you feel when you talk about the product itself? Yeah, I, I think that every brand needs energy. I mean, mm. the the where the fastest way to become irrelevant is to have no energy, and then right. people know about you. They may even like you, but they never think about you, and it, it's just not something that comes to mind when they're at that critical time of deciding what to buy. Mm. It, it it's uh, um. Anyway, that yeah, you 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 need energy. Uh, and and closely associated with energy is visibility, which is a cornerstone of brand equity. Brand equity has three components, and one is relevance, which consists of uh, visibility and and uh, credibility, and that's largely driven by energy. You could argue that it's all driven by energy at the core of it, yeah, and and whether you you perceive it as positive or negative energy is up to the marketing and the branding and the messaging that you put into that product. Now, when it comes down to the, the, the figuring out the positioning in the marketplace, let's say that, let's say that I'm running a, an agency on how to, uh, and I'm helping, uh, let's say chiropractors get patients or something. It doesn't matter what the business is. Where do I go when I, when I start to want to build these, uh, let's say a social program so I can start to have this message and the story told in an optimized way that's, that's felt with the right energy in the marketplace. Uh, where do I start with, with starting the social program? Let's say for an agency running for chiropractors. Well, um, that's really a good question. And it's not, it's not easy. It's right. very hard. And yeah. some people who would like to do it can't do it. Um, you know, I was in the board of a, an insurance company for a dozen years. And we, through that time, at my urging, we were trying to develop a signature program. And we developed some minor programs that were okay for a segment, but we weren't able to find an a, a overall program. It's not easy. And, uh, and, and, and then even if you find one, it's not easy to develop it. And uh, and then and and maintain um, a flow of resources to it over time, and that's why this the Thrivent uh, Act is is find a social program, and and adopt it as your signature program, and find somebody uh, else's program. Yeah, like Habitat for Humanity already right. has a brand, already mm. has a proven program, Interesting. already has right. scale. Already has a broad audience, so you're not looking at a, at a niche thing. Um, like our the, the insurance company, we developed a, a program where we had teddy bears that that the patrolman could give to kids that were involved in accidents, and it was a brilliant program. But it only was relevant to highway patrolmen, and that was only five percent of our customer base or something. So um, it was good, but. The habitat that that is something that works for all of the customers of of uh, thriving. 
You know what it reminds me of is with Tom's shoes, when they first started marketing their, their shoes, what they would do is they would give a pair of shoes to a child in Africa who needed a pair of shoes. And for every shoe you bought, they got a shoe too. Uh, and that just multiplied their marketing efforts and, and just threw gas on the fire because people were feeling a part of something bigger than them when they went to go purchase the product. Uh, same with this company, is a, I think it's a t-shirt company, 10 Trees Apparel, where every t-shirt you buy, they plant 10 trees. And so you're saying that you can connect and, and sort of latch on to a greater cause than what's your, what your actual physical product is or service is, and be able to leverage what their positioning in the marketplace is by associating yourself and your brand with them and by simultaneously doing good for for humanity and for contributing to that cause you're also having the monetary benefit of, of attaching yourself and the perception yeah, of and, and the attachment with their problem, perception that they've spent billions of dollars on maybe and the attachment problem it should be emphasized is is the following you want people that in the uh in the Thrivent community to recognize that Thrivent is is partnership with Habitat. You don't give a you don't give a rat's ass whether the people in the Habitat community know that Thrivent is a partner. That doesn't matter. It does though, because that opens up a potential joint venture partnership where if you got them to promote your product by by having them want to reciprocate because you've promoted their product or their their um, story that if they were to just do one deal with you where they promoted yours that would be a, a potentially massive opportunity where they that joint venture could it's an extra bonus of, of sort of attaching yourself to their brand you can say hey look at i've been able to get your message out to this amount of people what if we did a campaign together and you see that happen all the time when when um let's say a product partners up with a, uh, a known charitable organization and then they'll do a, a collab together. Um, so it does matter because if they can, one promotion would just change everything for a company if they had that that awareness um, and you're potentially opening up the door for that kind of a joint venture. What do you think about, about that angle of it? No, I, I think you're right. There, there are certainly, uh, if, um, uh, if, uh, you know, Habitat has Thrivent on their website, and right. and the people that ex are exposed to Thrivent that, and and there may be some of them that would become Thrivent customers. But you know, it's, we're talking about minute percentage there. But there are other situations in which it there there could be um, in a B two B case, maybe somebody um, you know a client could drift in that that direction, and um, that's fine. But um, uh, the, the task of of uh, making Habitat users in general, uh, which are such a broad, broad spectrum, they're not even, most of them aren't located in the areas that Thrivent operates, um, is, is, uh, is not necessary. I mean, it, it'd be a plus if it happens, like you said, it can happen in certain circumstances, but the focus should be on the, the the uh, the habitat employees and customers they're the ones that need to know and feel the partnership. Mm. How do you know what partnership to make? How do you know who to attach yourself with? That's, that's going to be that's resonant a in the really market? really good question. That's a really good question. Now, in, in um, you know, you Dove is came to market in uh, eighteen ninety or something as the beauty bar. Because it had this moisturizer, and and they and they, no, no, it was 1955. Sorry, and it, some it, some uh, product in the Second World War was uh, very gentle on wounds and so on, and they used that and created the moist moisturizer, mm -hmm. and so uh, they called it a beauty bar way back when. So they have some kind of legitimacy and and thing in beauty, but it's still kind of a reach. I mean, they're making soap, and this <laughs> is beauty. So it's it's still a reach, but there is some. And with Thrivent, I mean, this is financial services, and they're building homes. I mean, there's no connection at all. And 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 yet, in both cases, because of their passion, because of their long term commitment, hmm. it's not regarded as phony or contrived or uh, or or anything. It it's uh it's very authentic. 
So it, 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 but it's a really good question. It's not easy. I mean, the first place to look is uh, to say, we've got a product and, uh, and uh, operations and a customer base. Is there any way that we can leverage that to help a social program? And if so, let's have that kind of a social program or find one to sponsor. Um, another way is like I said at Barclays, you, it's bottom up. You have uh, employees that are engaged in social programs and, and some of them are sort of working out well and, and creating a lot of interest and a lot of energy and it's growing within your company. You know, maybe let's grab that and scale it. That's what Barclays did. Hmm. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, I don't know that the, the um, I mean, those are the two main things. It's either bottom up or, or top down that's focused on how can we use our resources and assets to uh, where where is that best served? Because then, uh, you know, not, we'll have an easier way making the connection in people's mind, and we'll actually have more credibility that we're adding value. Right. I mean, you're you're subconsciously making the connection between you and a greater cause at the end of the day. And I love that you're making that that connection like that, while also contributing to a greater cause at the same time. It's a win-win for everybody involved. Um, when it comes down to it, I mean, this is so interesting because when you're able to make that connection, you're formulating this sort of this, this bond with the clients. And so when it comes down to it, you got to know what they're already interested in, what your target audience is already interested in um, socially or, um, you know, at a greater level than themselves. And then you can tap into that. So it could even just be as simple as a survey or just asking your clients what their, their social interests are and be able to find a pattern and then attach yourself to the theme of the pattern that you're you're finding and that's emerging right what do you think about, yeah, I, about I that think, process? yeah i think i think that's all good ideas i think i'd go beyond interest and look at activities what do they do mm. and uh yes uh, and what are they doing socially yes, and so on and uh and and so yeah, a, a a real way to look at this connection is it's, you you have shared values, right? And this yeah. is my value and my priorities, and and I've noticed it's sim your priorities and your uh, values as well, and so I have an affinity for you. Now, let's say you've identified a pattern in your marketplace and you've found something like a greater cause that you could be contributing to and attaching your brand name to. How do you actually go about, tactically speaking, getting that message into the marketplace so that people understand that this connection takes place? What do you do to make sure that 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 people understand that when they think um, Habitats for Humanity, they think of your marketing program? How do you, tactically speaking, integrate this into your marketing campaign? Well, uh, the marketing campaign, you know, consists of of uh in that case it's it's the highest level of of communicating its engagement these right. guys are actually going to africa and building homes and they're coming back and talking about it to their families to their friends and uh uh so that's uh, that's the ultimate way and in uh in the uh dove case the, a lot of the employees are volunteering to teach in self esteem programs and so they really get involved. And incidentally, uh, a brand's um, target is is needs to be employees as well as customers right. or potential customers. Mm -hmm. It's really an important thing because you need to hire employees, you need to retain employees, you need to inspire employees, and and that comes from these from the brand. If the brand doesn't able to do that, uh, you're not going to be a you know, a, a thriving organization. Um, and so uh, uh, engagement is really, uh, really important. The other the other thing is is touching people. And one way to do that is with stories. Uh, right. Life Voice Soap in India developed a, uh, or sort of um, re-energized their washing hands program. And they gave it a brand called Help a Child Reach Five because two million kids below the age of five die every year. Yeah. And uh and and they did a lot of things in schools, a lot of programs, a lot of uh cartoon characters and and uh 
and and they just did a ton of stuff, a lot of events. And uh, they put their program into three villages in India. And they did a video of each of these village, villages talking about an affected mother in the village. Mm, one they mother. Yes. One mother. Yes. And they and they and they got and they put these videos out there. They got forty four million views. Yeah. Mm. Forty four million views. It this is a bar so this is another bar so. And right. that's all it is. It's a bar soap. And mm -hmm. um and and they got forty four million views. And um so uh the point is that way to communicate besides engagement and, and life boy had a lot of engagement in this program in each of these villages, but the the uh the the thing is stories and uh I um I don't wanna repeat myself but I, I actually wrote a book on that too called creating signature stories mm -hmm. and it's about how do you create stories to to tell this message to let people feel real touched by the by what they're hearing mm -hmm. a, a story that has um a real level you know characters you can relate to that has detail that brings it to life that is something that you want to uh um repeat and share Mm. And so uh, a, a really a, a good way to to communicate besides getting engagement is to create stories. What are some things yeah. that you've noticed in all the stories that spread like wildfire like that? What are some things you've noticed that they all have in common that we'd be able to replicate once we've found this brand or this this greater ideal that we're attaching our company to through our branding? How do you go about telling that story through a marketing video, for example? Um, well, there's how do you how do you make that connection in a way that captivates people and engages them to share? There's no checklist of of things that you have to have, but there's certainly a, a list of things that that uh, that tend to make the story come alive. I I encourage you to go to Life Boy Help a Child Reach Five and watch a couple of those videos. Right. I encourage you to go to Barclays and uh, look at uh, something called the Digital Eagles at Barclays. Just put in go to YouTube, put in Barclays Digital Eagles, and you'll get a couple of videos and and watch them, because they're both of those we know have have impact, and you'll you'll see, um, uh, you, you, you'll see what works. I googled it, and the first thing that comes up is exactly to your point. Roy, it's Barclays Digital Eagles, Roy's story. It's not a story about the masses. It's a story about one individual that they've pinpointed down to. And you and I find that that's a major theme when it comes to these, these videos and these stories that spread like wildfire is this one person. You don't see the, for example, the, the Africa um, feed or, or give water to these African children. You don't see them talking about these whole communities that desperately need water. You see them talking about the one mother who... who every single day walks to the well 10 miles each way to bring back a jug of water for her family. It's that one woman, that one individual that the, the person can resonate with and have that connection, that human to human bond in a way that if it was the one to many that, that you're trying to tell the story of everybody, which you are, but if you didn't have it down to an individual like Roy's story, then you wouldn't have that connection. The the, the audience wouldn't have, have that that one-to-one -one bond with the protagonist that makes them want to invest or to donate or whatever the cause may be at the end of the day. So that's a pattern that you notice. Um, what it makes me think of is Coney 2012. Do you remember that? Uh, in 2012, there was a big, uh, I, there was some sort of um, antagonistic figure in, in Africa who was doing horrible things to children, I think. And there was a massive upbringing in terms of the funding that was raised as a result of one of these. It was a 45 minute video, I think. I haven't, I haven't seen the thing in, in freaking 13 or 14 years, but the way I remember it, it was a 45 minute marketing video that just took the world by storm and was able to, to raise millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. And just by having this, this, um, the, what it is, is you're tapping into something deep in, in our human nature of wanting to help others. Um, it's, it's something that we all share and have in common. You're tapping into that with these, these stories about some, somebody, some individual that really resonates to the core with you. And I wonder if there's some sort of hero's journey that goes along with that. 
um, you know, the uh, the Joseph Campbell um, telling the story that we all go through over and over again in our lives, um, hopefully to a greater extent each time. Um, there is something in, in that, the same way that we were fascinated by watching a superhero movie, by watching the character evolve throughout time. You want to be a part of these stories of having uh, that, that feeling that you get when you're able to donate to a child in Africa and have them housed. And you're saying that you can, you can tap into this primal instinct to want to help others, um, half of us that wants to really be able to have this impact on others positively. Um, you can tap into that and associate it with buying your product. And like the 1%, for example, you buy our product, 1% of the time our employees spend of the profit that we make gets donated to this cause. And so you're almost positioning your product as a byproduct of the cause at the end of the day, right? Would you put but it like you, that? If you wanted, if, if Tom's wanted to... Um to really connect with that, they should tell a story of a person that received one of those shoes. Yes. Yeah. But I, I've, um, yeah, I think the hero model is is a good one. There are others, but um, what I also say is that a story is an inefficient way to communicate, and you need to communicate some facts. So how do you do that? Well, one way you do that is to use a story as a vehicle. If you put the facts in front of the story, then the story becomes, you know, let me tell you a story that illustrates the, the, the you know, what's behind these facts. You can have the facts built into the story, or you can have the facts follow the story and say, a after the, the facts then motivate, uh, the, the story mm. motivates the facts. Right. It provides a reason to listen and remember the facts. Whereas mm. the facts appeared by themselves, they, they wouldn't, be remembered so uh a, a story can illustrate it can motivate it can contain uh facts so it doesn't mean you have to um you know if you're if your communication goal is to communicate the facts it it doesn't mean that you can't use a story to do that Right. So the story, the facts can go before the story, in the story, or after the story. Each way, it depends on how you want to position the, the message you're getting across. You can start the, yeah. start the story off with a hook of facts. For example, there's a marketing campaign that worked. It was, um, uh, did you know that you've got more more bacteria in your in your sock every day than you do on a public toilet? And that that grasps your attention. You said, really? And then that brings you into the story where then you can move them through that um, the investment process that brings them to the end goal that you're trying to formulate at the end of the day in the campaign. Um, it's interesting. Man. Is there anything uh, else that you, you yeah, want to add? One more that? thing about stories, yeah. and that is that the, the, uh, the company, the brands that are very good at stories, uh, I'd using stories that is our B2B brands. You know, uh, my my company Profit, uh, we have a hundred stories of case studies of of uh, seeing us in action, building brand strategies or or growth strategies in different contexts. And if you got a context, we got a set of stories. But uh, in a B2B context, the stories tend to be watered down. They tend to be short. They t they follow some format, right. and they they don't tend to excite you. They, they don't tend to be something you'd want to share. They, you don't have any mm. aha, and that's partly because uh, clients are are reluctant to you know to admit that they were you know some stink hole that they needed something to get out. Or they think that somehow what they did was proprietary, and if others know about it, they'd copy them, they lose a competitive advantage. Or, the, or this instinctively shy and, and, and uh, you know, if, if you share your story, nothing good will happen, a lot of bad things could happen. So whatever it is, these stories tend to be watered down. And uh, so uh, that that's really, a, I, I think, a the problem for most companies is to is to buy onto the use of stories and develop them. For B two B companies, the problem is is not that it's to make the stories uh, come to life. Mm. 
to come to life. And you're saying that there are all kinds of examples you can model to make sure that you do make that story come to life in a way that if you just try to do it on your own, because what you're, you're tapping into patterns that, that have been shown to work with humans in the past. And if you model a campaign that's been able to elicit the same emotions that you need to elicit to get them to buy your product over here, you model a campaign that's worked. Um, you, you plug your, your initiative in with, with your target audience and your product, and you can formulate, a, sort of encapsulate something that you can bring to the marketplace and have these, uh, well, the associations of, of your company equals X social cause or X meaning in the mind, in the mind space of, of the target audience. Um, is there anything else you want to add in terms of, of helping somebody who's listening or watching be able to better brand their companies? Is there anything that we've missed or that you'd like to No, mention? Kyle, you've, it, uh, it's been a, uh, yeah, pretty productive hour. I think that you've, you've covered everything and, uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> it's my pleasure, Dave. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing your knowledge, man. You're you're definitely an eclectic, uh, carrying lots of wisdom, and you can you can see it radiate off of you. So, my friend, thank you so much for coming and, and sharing your wisdom with us. Sure. All right. I hope you enjoyed that podcast episode. And if you want to get a free copy of my book, go to kylesbook.com, and you can get a copy there. I'll talk with you soon.